Hey, so, uh, so we've been talking the last few weeks about covenant. Um, kind of a heavy topic, huh? Hard. And, and, and last week was amazing because we, we as Jason was teaching, we, we turned a new chapter, right? We started a new chapter. And we got to start talking about the new covenant. And um, the new covenant is amazing because it's, it's the story of what God's done. And instead of, of, of the law and, and, and this, this, this weight and this burden and this, this effort that we have to put out to comply with, with, a, with the covenant, he's done all the work for us through his son, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So he's given us a new life. He's called us into a new body and a new family, and he's created the new covenant. And Jason closed the message last week with a question. He said, do you want to know God? Do you want to know God? Because he wants to know you. And then there was a call, and there was a call to, to, make, to, to make that decision to, to follow God. And, and to, there was a call to, to take action, to get to know God, to reach out. Because the reality is that God wants a relationship with us. That God wants more than, than just a covenant uh, relationship like he had with, with his people Israel. He, he, wants, he wants a deeper relationship. He wants an intimate relationship. See, God wants, he wants, us, to, he wants us to know him as Father. That's kind of a scary word for a lot of us. Kind of a scary word for a lot of us. That, that word Father is... Um, Man, it, it amazes me, it amazes me the role of a father in our lives. The role that a father plays in, in the life of a child. And I know personally I have a, a six-year-old, you probably see her up here running around during worship, and I have an 11-year-old son, he's usually up in the balcony with the crew, and um, we keep him in the basement during, during teaching. Um, that's where we teach the youth. <laughs> I love it, I think that's the funniest thing in the world. Nobody else? It's okay, it's okay. Um, so as a father, I see the value of, 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 of the value of a father in the raising up of a child. And, and I think that we, we as people fall into one of two camps. Either, either we love it and we long for it, um, usually because, uh, because of our upbringing, because of our childhood, because of the way that we were raised, because of the way that our father was involved in our life. May, Maybe whether good or bad, some of us, we just, we long for that fatherly affection in our life. So either we long for it or we loathe it. And, and there's that whole other camp too of, of people that have been hurt, people that have been abused, maybe people that, that they grew up in, in broken families and, and, and in a broken home. I, I don't know if you guys, if you guys are tracking with me, but there's, there's, there's that, that whole camp of people that just, they don't know what to do with it. And so I think sometimes when we talk about God as Father, we come to Him with thoughts that are shaped, that are shaped by the world. We come to Him with thoughts that are shaped by the relationships that we see here in, in the physical world. And the truth is, you guys, we are broken people, right? We've been talking about the storyline, the storyline of the Bible, and one of the first things we talk about is, is, is how we as, as humans, as we as man have fallen. And we, we talk about fall, the fallenness of man and, and how God needed to come in and restore that. Well, in the same way, I think what God wants to do tonight is I think he wants to restore the perspective of, of, and the role of a father in our, in our lives and in our hearts. And I believe that tonight God wants us to look at the heart of a father and not to look at any human example, but to look at the scriptures, to look at the word of God. Because the, the truth is that the reason that that word father has such great weight, the we, reason that the word father has such deep meaning in our lives is because God uniquely crafted us, I believe, with a father-sized hole in our heart, a hole that only he can fill. And so many of us, male and female alike, we try and fulfill that with, with earthly things. We try and fulfill that here in the physical. We try and fulfill that with, with relationships. And whether that's 
having just, if you're a guy, whether it's just having a, a really great bro that just walks alongside you and he's there for you and, and he's just standing there for you or, or maybe you're, you're, you just, you lo- your father is just, you guys have a sweet relationship or so many women look for that, that fatherly figure that they look to fill that fatherly hole with other male companionship, with other male relationships in their lives. But see, God designed us he was very intentional. See, he had a plan and he had a purpose and he crafted each one of us with a uniquely shaped hole that only he can fill. So I want to look at that tonight. If you guys want to turn with me, we're going to be in the, the book of Luke, um, Luke chapter 15. So I'm going to jump in uh, chapter 15. We're going to start in verse 11. And this is a story. This is Jesus talking here. Uh, Jesus is talking to a group of, uh, it says, it tells us that he's talking to tax collectors and he's talking to sinners and the scribes and the Pharisees, they come and and they're asking questions. And so he's addressing this multitude of people. Now these aren't necessarily his disciples, but but these are people probably just like you and I who are seeking, who are are looking for for an answer. These are people who are, who are, who have questions about life. And so he, he tells this story And I believe it's the story of a father. So starting in verse 11, Jesus says, There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of my property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. And not many days later, the the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country. I want to stop right there. My first thought is, really? This son had the nerve to go to his father and to say, well, say, I want my inheritance and I want it now. Now, we all know what an inheritance is and when you get it. We get an inheritance when somebody dies, when somebody passes on. The inheritance is what they leave for us. So this son has the nerve to go to his father and he doesn't ask. Notice. The son says to the father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. See, he knows it's a future thing, but he says, give it to me and I want it now. To him, his father was as good as dead. He didn't think he needed his father in his life. What was more important to him were the riches that his father had. Are we tracking with, it's really hard to find good pictures But I actually love this picture because check this out. So you've got the fatherly figure. Actually, it's grandpa, right? And then Donald Duck, the fatherly figure, and the sons. But what are they doing? They're measuring the wealth. Because to them, see, they weren't interested in the relationship. They were only interested in the possessions. They were interested in the things that they could get from their father. And so many of us come to the father like that. This son here, he comes to the father like that. And he says to the father, he says, I don't need you, I need, I need these riches, and I want to take them now. The second point that I want to make about this section is I want to look at the response of the father. Notice the father says, and he divided his property between them. Period. It's like half a sentence. The father didn't argue. The father didn't plead. The father didn't ignore his son, didn't rebuke his son. Man, if my son came to me and said, Dad, I want my inheritance and I want it now. First of all, it's like five bucks, so it wouldn't be a big deal. (laughs) But if I had something and he came to me and said that, I would be flabbergasted. And, And me and my son, we'd have words. And, and, and I would speak into his life. I would bring some rebuke and some correction. You better believe. I would not let my son address me like that. Now, we know that this man, that he had great wealth, and we'll see that a little bit later in the story. There's, there's some, some points that, that illustrate the, the measure of wealth that this father had. But this father, he loved his son enough to let the son go. See, what I think, and I believe that this is our Father's heart, 
is that our Father loves us enough that if we say, I want to have nothing to do with you, He lets us go. Now we'll see later, we'll see the follow-up. Because it's not just, there's not just an abandonment of the Son. The Father doesn't just abandon the Son. See, we'll see later where the Father still loved the Son. The Father actually was pursuing, was desiring relationship with the Son, but the Son was making the choice. And the Father, like our Heavenly Father, says, if, if you want to take these riches, then here you go. He gives His Son what He asked for. It doesn't always seem like the best thing, but this scripture is, we're looking at God as the Father. This, this is portraying our Father. This, this story is talking about the Father here is, is giving us an idea of what our Father is like. Okay, so, um, so I want to move on in the scriptures. We're going to start in, chapter, in uh, verse 13 now. See what happens, how that goes for the son. It says, not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had, and he took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the field to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. And no one gave him anything. Okay, how'd it turn out for the son? Not so well. Not so well. The, the son ended up with absolutely nothing watching pigs, feeding pigs. I think I got a picture of that. This is like the filthiest man I've ever seen in my life. And there were some really funny cartoons that I was tempted to put up there, but, but I went with a realistic picture because I think that it, it, it really helps to articulate and to communicate the, the depravity of this son, how, how, how miserable this son was, how little he actually had. It says that he longed to eat what it was that the pigs got to eat. He, he longed for it. I think that, that, that God would ask us a question because, see, like this son, I believe that God has given us great things. God has given us great things. And it might not be material riches, might not be financial, might not be financial gain. It might just be great relationships or it might be an incredible gift to communicate. It might be the gift of joy. It might be a gift of helps. But the, the, the point I'm making is that God, like this father giving great inheritance to his son, God has given each of us great things. And I think that there's a question that we get to ask ourselves, and that question is, what has the father given you that you've squandered? Because each of us, like this son, in some sense, in some way, in our lives, there's been time where, where we've squandered wealth, where we've squandered the things that, that God has given us. Man, I look back on my own life and, and, and I look at, 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 at the, the ebb and flow of, of blessings, as I'll say, and I, I just go, oh my gosh, what in the world would life have looked like if I would have thought differently or if I would have thought responsibly and acted differently? What would life have looked like if I had only sought the Lord and said, Lord, what is your will for me to do with this? You're providing me a job with, with means beyond my, my needs. What are, you to, what are you calling me to do with this? And, and many of us, myself included, I, I thought that it was really important that I had a super nice car. I thought that it was really important that we had a big house. And, and, I, wanted, and I was so proud of of the, the money that, 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 I was, that I was earning, right? I, not recognizing that God was giving, God was blessing, and he had a plan and he had a purpose in that. I never once stopped to consider that. And I was so happy that I could be the provider for my family, that, that, that we could have things in abundance. And like I said, now we're, I, I, I've, I've spent it all I don't have anything to show for, for so many things that the Lord has done in my own life. And I think it's a, a really important question to ask. I think, 
I think in, in, in a sense, some of us are stuck here at this point. Like the man sitting with the pig. Some of us are just stuck in the mud. And some of us are afraid to get up and walk. Some of us look down and the mud is so sticky and it's so wet and it's so deep and we don't have any shoes to walk through it and we just, we're just stuck. We can't trudge through it. And some of us need the hand of a father to pull us out of it. Some of us need our brothers and sisters, the body of Christ, to reach into our mucky situation, to not be afraid to get a little dirty and to help us up. But we gotta want it. We gotta want it. Some of us are so comfortable because that mud, though, though it's it filthy and nasty and disgusting as it is, it, it, it's warm and it's, it's kind of mushy and it's, it's like, it's, we, we're like, we've got it in our head that we're at like some spa in a mud bath. You're laughing because you know exactly what I'm talking about. I love that. Then you're tracking with me. Because we've been there. And some of us are still there. And what I hope tonight is I hope for us to move out of that place. I hope for us to hear the call of the Father, to recognize who He is and to recognize His love for us and, and to acknowledge that and to take some action to do something about our situation. I want to keep reading in, in verse 17. In verse 17 it says, speaking of this son, but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. The truth is that if he were to stay there, I don't believe he's any better off than being stuck in the mud. See, how many of us are content being servants or being slaves? How many of us are okay with that bondage? We're okay being here in the Father's house, but really we're we're wrapped in chains and, and we're stuck in the mud still. See, we think we're with the Father, but really in our own effort, we've decided that we're gonna turn from those ways, we're gonna get out of the mud, we're gonna go home, we're gonna say, Father, I repent, let me be a servant, and we're gonna try so hard to please Him. You guys know what I'm talking about? We try so hard to serve Him. We try so hard to listen to what he wants us to do. Take out the trash, sweep the floor, come to clean up day. Sorry, we should really all come to clean up day. <laughs> but for different reasons. See, how many of us desire to serve because we recognize that we've squandered everything that God has given us? And we feel like in order to get back into the Father's house, we need to come to Him and we need to produce something. We need to do something. How many of us feel like that? And how many of us are content being servants? How many of us are okay with slavery? As I, as I, really, as I prayed and, and just sought God, what do you have for us tonight? I really feel... Like that question above all, if I had one question or if I had one sentence to say, it, it, that, that would be the question. Are we okay being servants in the Father's house? Because that's not his desire for us. And I felt like the Lord impressed upon my heart that he has something more and that he wants by, the, by a move of his spirit to free us, to free his people from the slavery and the bondage that we're in so that we could engage relationally with our Father as Abba, as Daddy. And he gave me a scripture, I wanna look at it. It's Romans 8, 15. It says, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, 
but you receive the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Say that with me, Abba, Father. Yes. How many of us are here crying, Abba, Father? How many of us are here because, because we've been set free? And how many of us are here out of fear? How many of us are here out of obligation? How many of us are coming because, because we, we want to serve our daddy? Think about the way that a servant would act in a household. Think about that. What does a servant do? A servant is constantly looking to the master of the house for direction. Constantly looking to the master of the house for instruction. A servant is adamant about or should be intentional about keeping themselves busy. A, should, a servant should be doing things. In this case, he wanted to be a hired servant. So more than anything, that servant has to be worth what he's getting paid. The servant understands that the father or the, the master of the house is paying something and has an expectation of a return on his investment. And, and if, if we know anything about the Father God, he is going to be a great steward of, of his resources. And anybody that he hires to do any work, he's going to get the most for his buck. I guarantee it. But see, that's not our Father. And that's not how we live in his house. See, God brings us into his house as sons. Right? Amen. God brings us into his house as sons. And how does a son live in a house? How does a son live in a house? I want to read here the way that the father responds to this son. Because remember, the son comes to the father and he says, and, and he's telling, he's saying, I'm, I, I want you to treat me as one of your hired servants. So in verse 20, if you read with me, back in Luke, verse 20, it says, And he rose, speaking of the son, and he came to his father. But while the son was still a long way off, the father saw him and felt compassion. And he ran and he embraced him and he kissed him. Man, that would be enough. But it goes on in verse 21. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants. Now notice, pause right there. Notice. I love this daddy, man. He's all about action. Like, I don't think we hear a single word from the father in this story until he's talking to another son. But he, with this son, he doesn't even say a word. As he did when he gave his son the riches, he responds by taking action again. And we see it here. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Bring and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son was dead and he is alive again. He was lost and he is found. And it says they began to celebrate. Look at how the father responds when the son comes back. How many of us long to be received into the Father's house in that way? How many of us have been received into the Father's house in that way? <clears throat> so we see here that this Father, he was a wealthy man. He says, bring the best robe. I imagine that there was a wardrobe full of them. He says, bring the best robe, bring a ring, bring sandals, the fattened calf. He's sparing no expenses for this son. How do you think that that son lived in the house? It probably looked a little bit like our time of worship tonight. Oh, man, I was so blessed sitting over on the side here and just, man, we were in it. You guys, the spirit, I could just feel the spirit of God in this place and the sons and daughters of the king. We were crying out to our father. We weren't worried about serving him. We don't come here tonight as a hired servant, but there's so many of us are just reaching out and we, it was like we were touching God. It was like he was reaching down from heaven and he was meeting us here. 
He was meeting us right where we're at. You see, a son in a father's house, he doesn't have to earn his keep. A son doesn't have to earn his keep. A son doesn't have to to, to worry about the chores that he's going to do because there's an expectation on him. Now a son, when he's in love with his father, when he understands that relationship, the son by all means is going to want to serve the father. But that obedience is going to come out of his love for the father. He's going to show up to clean up day for a totally different reason. Yes. I love you guys. are so excited to clean the church. Can't wait. So many of us, so many of us are still stuck in the mud. And so many of us that have gotten out of the mud are still stuck here as servants. But every single one of us, God wants to bring in as a son. Amen? Every one of us, God wants to bring in as a son. Look at what the, son, look at what the father does. His actions. He sees the son. Now, where did he see the son? The son was far, far off. That tells us that the father was looking for the son. The father was watching. We have no idea how long this son was gone. But if he had treasures that looked anything like Donald Duck's treasures, it was a pretty long time. Because no matter how much money you spend, to, to, to squander great, great wealth would take some time. So we know that the son was gone for a long time, and we know that there was a famine in the land. We know that it was so severe that, that there wasn't enough food. So, so it had to have been a season of years, right? We're, I mean, they're saying that we're in a drought here in the valley, and it's been like a, a year, year and a half. They're talking about this drought, and, and we still don't have any lack of food. How long does it take for there to be a famine in the land? This father, see, this father never never stopped watching the son. This father never stopped longing for that relationship with the son. And this father didn't wait. See, many of us think this way. We think that, that our heavenly father is waiting for us to come to him. See, this father ran, and this is a picture of God. This is the only picture in the Bible that we see God running. The only metaphor, the only, the only, uh, uh, the only parable that we see where, where, where God is running. And who is he running to? He's running to his son who's returning home. He says that the father, from a long way off, he sees the son and he runs to him. And, and it says that he embraces him. It doesn't say he hugged him. Like, how many hugs did my wife say that we needed? Eight. Reagan said we need eight hugs. And there was, who was it that gave me a hug? I said, I need a manly size hug. Who was that? Thank you. (laughs) That's right. So he comes and gives me a hug, and I'm like, that's not no hug. Come on. Like, I mean, in church, it's like we got to get through eight of them. Come on, one, two, three, four. No. It, see, this father didn't hug the son. The father embraces the son. I think I got a picture of a father embracing a son. There's tears in his eyes. He's probably exhausted from running, an old dude like that running way far off to meet his son. But he doesn't care. He's going to push through it. He's going to get to his son. And, and he fall, he just, I imagine he just fell on his son just embraced him and I imagine I imagine that it went on and on I imagine that he just held his son he just he didn't even want to let go that's our heavenly father he doesn't want to let go you guys he wants he wants he wants to embrace us he says that he, the, the father kissed the son then they celebrate brings him home and they celebrate And I think that it's time for us as a church to start celebrating a little more often. Amen? Right on. I think it's time for us as a church to celebrate. I think it's time, I I think it's time for us as a church to take stock in where we're at. And I asked that question earlier, 
You know, what is it that we've squandered that, that God has given us? And, and, and I, I want to be clear. It's never my heart, and I don't think it's God's heart, to bring guilt or shame. It's, it's, never, it's never His heart to make us feel so bad about, about the past. See, He wants to free us from that, right? He wants to free us. This father didn't say a single word to his son. The son says, let me be a servant. And the father just ignored him like he didn't say a word and says, bring the robe, bring the ring, put the sandals on his feet, and let's celebrate. And that's, that's what God wants to do with us. And see, some of us come to the father and we're, we're, we're father, okay, you know, we're, we're making an appeal. Okay, I'll, I'll come back to you. And this time it's going to be, father, just let, me, just let me be in your house. Let me be in your presence. And sometimes I think he just ignore, ignores us and just says, just let me bless you. Come on, just let me love you. That's our Father's heart. And that's our Heavenly Father. And see, the fathers of this world have, have so tainted our perspective of fatherhood. Even good fathers, we, we mess up when we make mistakes. That when we think of Father, there, there's, there's, there's oftentimes fear, there's oftentimes doubt, there's worry. We don't trust. But see, with Jesus, the new covenant, with God, we can let go of all of that. And we can come into Him and we can trust Him fully. And, and I think that God wants us just to, to trust Him and, and I don't think he wants us just to trust him with, with our evening. I don't think we, he wants us just to trust him with, with our time on Saturday nights together. I think he wants us to trust him with everything. I, want, I think he wants us to come and to lay at his feet everything that we've been slaving to make right, everything we've been slaving to do right for him. I think he wants us to lay at his feet our jobs, our relationships, our possessions, I think he wants us to lay at his feet our everything, our very being. I think he wants us to come and to worship him with our heart and with our mind and with our soul, with all that we are. He wants us to come to the altar. He wants us to come to him and to give him everything. And you know what? He's going to bless our socks off more than we could ever imagine. You know, tonight we're going to wrap up with communion. The worship team's going to come up and, and, and they're going to br- usher us into some worship. And you guys, I want to go into the throne room. I want to come to the feet of the Father. And communion is, is so sacred for us. As Christians, as believers, it's, it's the tangible, it's the physical reminder of the spiritual work that Christ has done for us. See, this bread, when we come up and we take this bread... It's symbolic of Christ's body that was broken for us. And the juice is symbolic of his blood that was shed for us. And as we take that bread and and, and put it in that juice, and as we, and I I just think every time I I come to the table, I realize that I'm like chewing on this piece of bread. Like, Like I'm responsible for like mushing this up and just messing it up. And I'm just, but I remember and we're called to remember Christ's sacrifice on the cross. And this is symbolic of the new covenant, the new covenant that we learned about last week. We get to experience, and we do this together as brothers and sisters. And you know, we've, we've got all this space up here, and there's a whole bunch of us pastors who are here to pray if, if, if we need prayer. There's, pe- there's brothers and sisters next to you that would pray with you. If you're stuck in the mud and you need a hand up, get someone to give you a hand up. The Word of God tells us to come and, and, and to ask for prayer. It talks about healing. It says, come and, and have the elders of the church lay hands on and, and pray for you that you'd be healed. This is the time to do that. This is the time to respond. This is the time for us to come to our Abba Father. Because... As Romans 8.15 said, you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. So let's come to the Father as Abba tonight.
let's worship him and let's rejoice. Let's picture that, that fattened calf that was, was, was feasted upon. Let's picture that, picture that celebration that that whole family had. 